thank you for joining today's webinar. And at this time, I'd like to turn it over to Bill. Great, good morning, everyone. Thanks, Michelle. Um, my name is Bill Heaven. I'm a senior director here at HVK. And this is welcome to our monthly risk advisory webinar series. Um, this morning, we're gonna talk about the uh, Verizon data breach um, investigations report, which is an annual report that comes out. It's one of the webinars that I look more forward to than the others to putting together because it's always uh, a lot of inf useful information. It's, I learned something myself putting this thing together for you all. So um, I'll get going on this. So here's our agenda for this morning. Along with that, I'll, I'll uh, take care of a few housekeeping issues. So this morning's webinar is eligible for CPE credit. And in order to uh, receive the CPE credit, uh, you'll need to remain online for the whole presentation and then answer four content sensitive questions that we're gonna pop up throughout the, uh, the webinar today. So um, in the last, the last of the four questions would be just simply, yes, I wanna receive CPE or no, I don't. Um, and if you answer yes, then we'll take care of uh, getting you your CPE certificate based on the fact if you did um, answer the previous three questions. Um, there is gonna be a copy of the slide deck today and a PDF version that's gonna be in your related content box on your browser. If you do have any trouble, we're gonna be monitoring the chat window, but so if you can still type, you can send us a message and Michelle will be monitoring that. Otherwise, probably the fastest way to take care of any issues that you're having with the On24 platform is to just simply refresh your browser and that will fix most of the issues that people have. And then we are recording this morning's webinar. So later on this week, we'll send out everyone um, that registered a copy of the slide deck as well as a link to to replay the um, the webinar recording itself. Um, these are our, our learning objectives, which are part of the requirements that we have to put up for being a CPE um, registered um, participant, whatever we call that. So these are your kind of your takeaways of what what we intend for you to learn or have a have as a takeaway from this morning's uh, webinar. As I said, um, I'm a senior director here at HBK. I've this I've been with HBK for just over six years now, and I have a dual role where I, I work with clients on our risk advisory services side of the business, as well as I handle IT security for the firm itself. So it's, um, like I said, a dual role. And I wanted to start off this, this year's um, risk advisory uh, data breach uh, update with just a little poll question, just to kind of get the, get a sense of the audience of what what your familiarity is with the uh, Verizon data breach report. So if you wouldn't mind answering these questions, could be like, I, I think it's Christmas Eve when uh, before this thing's issued or I never even heard of it before. So if you can uh, give me a, a quick answer on the polling question, uh, then we'll get into some of the deeper content. Okay, so as a looks like um, looks like we got a number of people that are about eighty percent are are familiar with it. Um, some are are not, but um, we've got the pretty good representation there. It's kind of what I expected. Um, 
All right, so let's uh, let's dive into the uh, the the details here, and we'll start off with our background agenda and and go on um, talking about this year's Verizon uh, data breach investigations report, which was released in very early May. It, it kind of um, is that I'm seeing a Q and A with the volume. Can you hear me better now? Um, like I was saying, the Verizon report it comes out in May. Typically, uh, it, it's kind of um, hit or miss on if it's the 1st of May or the 21st of May. I've seen it um, both ways. Last year was a little later. This year was a little earlier. But um, that does come out every year. And um, this, as a matter of fact, on some details, this is the um, 17th annual edition of the report. Um, back in 2008, it started, and it was just a compilation of what Verizon had as far as their information. Now they work through what's called contributing organizations, which are basically security related firms. Um, if you can, you can look in the uh, detail report, it has all 79 contributing organizations, which are, you know, some of the bigger cybersecurity players, um, some of the infrastructure, but it's the organizations that you would think would um, participate and they, Verizon takes all their input from those 20 um, or 79 contributing organizations. Now that varies from year to year. I think two years ago, it was approximately um, I think I want to say 80 some contributing organizations. Then last year it dropped down to like high 60s. And now this year it's back up to 79. I'm not quite sure what the rationale is for the flexibility there, but it does move from year to year. Uh, but there are some stable um, contributing organizations that are in there year after year. I know there's a forensics firm that's uh, headquartered up in Cleveland that they've been doing it for like eight years in a row now. So for some reason you get some new and additions and subtractions every year, but uh, I think a lot of them are the same. The report does break everything down into 20 industries that are governed by the NAICS code. And we'll talk about that more and also go on some of the uh, definitions here of Verizon's definition of incident versus data breach. The, this year, the 2024, over 30,000 incidents, which translated into, by the definition, 10,626 confirmed breaches. So that, um, I think that was last year's report was somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 to 14,000 incidents and only 5,000 breaches. So that's partly a um, factor of there was less contributing organizations last year. So this year's population obviously is a bit bigger, but that those numbers will vary. And I'm gonna go into some details in the next few slides, talking about the industry classification and then the definitions of how the reports um, architected. So for those of you that wanna get CPE, here's our first question. So I'll just um, give everybody 30, 40 seconds to, uh, to update that. And Michelle, if you see that it looks like we got a, at least half our population uh, going with the CPU question, just let me know or advance the slide and I'll, I'll move on to the next, next topic. Okay, thanks. So now we're gonna dive more into the, um, like I said, how the Verizon Data Breach Investigations Report is, is put together every year. So Verizon came up with their own, I'll call it a classification system. Um, and they wanted to do this so that they could have some consistency from year to year. 
as far as so people can compare, you know, what happened last year versus what they saw the year before or the year before that. So they've come up with something called the Virus, which is uh, um, V-E-R-I-S, which is an acronym for the vocabulary for event reporting and incident sharing. And as you can see, it's got eight categories from denial of service through a catch-all of everything else. So Verizon, everything that comes into those, they're gonna try to put it into one of those eight patterns and use those same, they've been doing that since 2010, which was year three of the, the Verizon uh, data breach investigations report. So they've been using that and it's further broken down into what they call as the four A's of actor, action, um, okay, I'm looking at the QA. The, so Michelle, we may have something with uh, one of the people was trying to get a question, but um, that's about, a, looks like about a minute ago. So I, if we can follow up with you, Karina, if there's a problem after the fact, but um, we'll make a note of that. So talking about the four A's of actor, action, asset, and attribute. So the actor, and again, if you want details on this, I'm gonna talk about in the next few slides, how to get a copy of your of the Verizon 2024 report. So it goes into great detail and they have like a page on each of these four attributes. But the, the actor is just basically who most likely it's going to be the threat actor, like who's doing the bad guy things. Um, the action is like the, the pattern that they're going to use. And in the report, it talks about um, top patterns, the, like based on industry. So like this industry is more susceptible to social engineering or this other is more susceptible to ransomware or a business email compromise or privilege misuse or going back to the eight patterns of the um, virus. Um, and then the asset is like what they're going after. And it'll tell you by industry, like what's most commonly stolen, like retail might be credit card information or it's gonna vary from year to year. And then the, uh, the attribute is like what, down to the nuts and bolts of uh, data security, the what's called the CIA triad or confidentiality, integrity, availability, the big three, as far as like what we wanna keep, keep up and running so that we have access to our systems and our data. And then, so these are the, going into some of the details of what the definition of these eight um, various categories of what the Verizon considers their definitions for DOS denial of service attacks. You have lost and stolen assets, um, privilege misuse. So you can like, those are basically when you talk about credential theft and um, miscellaneous errors not including lost devices, but are grouped with theft. So those are the first half of the uh, virus categories or patterns. And then the second half being social engineering, system intrusion, web application attacks, and then our catch-all pattern, pattern or category. And then, like I said, if you remember from when I first started talking, we had 30,000 plus incidents and then only 5,000 and some confirmed breaches. So that's based on our definition of incident where it's talking about the compromise of, again, this is the CIA triad, um, confidentiality, confidentiality, integrity, availability of an information asset. So this is just that somebody Get, so if somebody gets access to your data, but they don't steal it, you know, because the co the confidentiality has, has been um, a bridge there. So that's, that's Verizon's definition of an incident. 
And then uh, a breach, the key there is that it's saying that it's a confirmed disclosure, not just exposure. So disclosure means they actually took it as opposed to they actually maybe just saw it on the screen. So that's what Verizon is using for their definitions and why why there's the difference in numbers from 30,000 and some incidents to only 5,000 and some confirmed breaches. So it's a, a big difference there, but um, again, based on their definitions is what, what they're using to, to drive the report so that again, it's consistent from year to year. Now there's, I talked about the, uh, the NAICS code, which is used by a lot of industries primarily it um, it got its basis in um, being used by Canada, Mexico, and the United States, but but it's being attributed to globally here as the Verizon report is definitely a global report, and you can see that if you get the the true version because it's going to give you some details on these specific industries. It's going to give you information and it gives you a nice um, synopsis that talks about for each the industries that they highlight not all 20 of them but the ones they highlight it'll give you a nice table talking about the free the frequency how many of those incidents were um, applicable to a particular industry um, talks about what the actor motives and we're going to talk about some of these on some upcoming slides but um gives you a little summary, what's the same, what's different. So again, I recommend that everybody, you know, take advantage of this, this resource um, being that every one of us should be looking to protect our systems and our data. So you, you need to start with the risk assessment and this Verizon report gives you um, some background on based on your industry or your, um, you know, it, it can give you some things to use as inputs to your risk assessment report, which we'll talk about a bit later. But um, you know, it, it's good, uh, and I'll I'll defer to to the later section. We'll talk more about risk assessments. But the Verizon report does give you a lot of good information. It's not considered. It shouldn't be considered that it's fact, that it's a prediction that's gonna come true, but it's based on details that have happened to other country companies across the world. So it does give you a basis for making your judgment on a risk assessment because you're we're gonna talk um, you know, likelihood and impact as a way to calculate risk. But specifically about the um, the NAICS code is um, there's 20 industries that are talked about in the, the code and they're listed up here. Again, uh, unknown at, as a catch-all. I said earlier that NAICS was used predominantly. It started out with Canada, Mexico, and the United States. And it's a six digit, five or six digit code. And what I've put on there is the first two digits, which is the sector of the industry. So it's talks about the first two digits being a sector, third digit, a subsector, fourth digit, an industry group, fifth digit, an industry, and sixth, if it's existence, a national industry. So it's, you see the first two codes up there, which is the sector, but it could expand out and be an actually a five or six digit code. But again, they're gonna group everything into those 20 categories and they do that the same every year so that you can get some consistency between versions of the DBIR. And then we're going to uh, go for those people wanting CPE, their second um, CPE question. So again, I'll give you uh, 30 or so seconds and Michelle, go ahead and advance the slide when it looks like we got about the same number of people that um, responded as the last time.
Okay, thanks, Michelle. So that, moving on, talking more about our background of our DBIR. Um, again, this is why you should pay attention to the DBIR. It's um, basically we've got cyber threats out there that are changing on a daily basis. If, if you heard the term zero day attack, those are basically everything that's just, you know, coming up in the immediate future. It's like there's there's nothing out there. Nobody had any insight that that thing was there or there's no warning. So it's basically it's a, it's a zero day. But if you want to keep your data secure, keep your company's name out of the headlines, then you you need to be prepared for the, the uh, risks or threats that your business or industry could face. And the Verizon report is a, is a good resource to help you do that. Um, again, you can't view it as a prediction, um, but it's likely outcome, so it should help you be able to plan. Um, and it's, you know, it's just one of the key things, like along with vulnerabilities, Vulnerability that are out there, those are happening all the time. And you have the, uh, the MITRE database where you're tracking vulnerabilities. And like I've said on previous webinars, the bad guys are out there checking your vulnerabilities. So you should be scanning for vulnerabilities and checking to make sure that you stay ahead of the bad guy. And the bad guys are also reading the Verizon report. And so they're seeing what people are planning for and, you know, they're, Maybe it'll give them some good ideas if they, well, I hadn't thought about doing social engineering. So I'm going to start doing that based on the fact that people fall for it every year. So it's just a good resource and era to have in your quiver. So how do I get a copy of the Verizon report? So the easiest thing to do is just open up uh, a search bar, pretty much Google um, Edge, Microsoft Edge, whatever, um, you know, you're going to find it and just do a, put in the, the uh, literal 2024 Verizon DBIR and it's, it's going to take you to a Verizon site. Verizon is the author of it. And so typically you can do a verizon.com slash DBIR. And I'll, I'll show you a couple of the slides that will come up, but it's, it's pretty easy to get it. And it's a, a full blown web page. So they can, they'll give you an online version of the report. You can read it, you can download it, you can get a full version, you can get a executive summary. There's links to webinars. They'll talk about the report and walk you through it. Each of those webinars usually last 45 minutes to an hour. It gives you certain industry snapshots. So there's typically a, uh, manufacturing industry snapshot. So if that's your industry, you can um, get a specific tailored version that's going to be a little bit different than that. It's going to be along the lines of the executive summary that's going to be shorter, but it's going to specifically just talk about that particular industry. So a lot of information at that site. Um, now, I know that this year's full version is approximately 100 pages and gets into a lot of details. Like I said, it talks about the virus four actors and gives you definitions there. Um, talks more about some of the industries, goes a little bit deeper diving or the executive summary is only about 17 pages this year, but that's about pretty, pretty consistent. So, but you can get, and it's free and it's I'll, the next couple of slides will show you some of the, um, what the screen looks like, but it's basically going to ask you for, um, you can review the report online or download it. Um, it's going to, all you have to do is you're going to have to put in your name and your email address and they aren't going to, they're not going to bug you terribly, but they are going to bug you. You're going to get a couple of emails saying like, they're going to try to say, do you want to, talk to us about cybersecurity services. I've never responded to one of their emails and I still get to download the report every year, but uh, you will get a handful of emails. And then you can, if you're interested in learning about what they're emailing you about, go ahead and respond affirmatively, or you can just 
basically um, fall through and and ignore it, and nothing nothing terrible is going to happen. So you, it's up to you. Now let's talk about some of the key takeaways from the 2024 report. All right, so here's, I, I just summarized this into the, the top six. So breaches due to exploitation of vulnerabilities has tripled. So that that is actually up 180% from last year. Now ransomware by itself was about 23% this year, which is right around the same as it's been for the last two years. It, ransomware has been holding right around 25%. So this year, just specifically, it was 23%, but Verizon has grouped that together with extortion techniques because that's basically what ransomware is. And, so, and it also reflects some of the enhancements that the uh, ransomware pirates have started to do, where in addition to encrypting your data, they basically steal your data and um, take it, and then they threaten you with, we're going to publish it. So it's extortion comes up with about 9% of the total. So you have the nine and the 32 coming up with the 32% of breaches are either ransomware or extortion. And the reason why the, the pirates or the ransomware pirates have uh, moved to that approach is because they weren't, people weren't paying the ransoms because they, they had a good enough disaster recovery incident response that they could go back to a, a good backup and they wouldn't pay for the uh, the encrypted code because the things you have to keep in the mind with ransomware is when once you so basically first off you're dealing with a, a bad person that's probably not the most ethical in the world so how do you know that they're going to unencrypt your data if you pay the ransom or how do you know that they're not going to just hit you with another ransomware attack and like a week or a day and you're going to be back in the same boat so a lot of people were just beefing, beefing up their processes and procedures and coming up with a good incident response and making sure they had an immutable backup that wasn't going to get corrupted by the ransomware and they could rely on it and so they wouldn't pay the they wouldn't pay the ransom so then the ransomware pirates got the idea that well we'll just embarrass them with some of their data getting it out there so we'll we'll do a multiple thing we'll encrypt it and we'll publish it and embarrass them so that's why one of the reasons why verizon turned it into ransomware and extortion but together they're um totaling 32 percent of all breaches and point key takeaway three is, is a big one here the ransomware is a top threat across 92 percent of those 20 makes industry. So virtually everybody is dealing with ransomware. Um, some of the statistics that the BBIR was able to put together is that the average ransomware payment is $46,000 um, as of 2024. So that may not seem like a lot. For, now the range is, is kind of uh, questionable is it, it goes from a low of three dollars so i'm not quite sure that makes a lot of sense to me like some somebody was able to get their data back just by paying three dollars and the high end of the range was 1.1 million so overall everything averaged out to 46,000, which still i wouldn't want to have to come up with that kind of change to uh to get my data back so it's still pretty deep but what what they were able to find out more and than that is that the the ransomware pirates are kind of using a formula which it goes from 0.13 percent to 8.3 percent of your revenue so again I've, I've been hearing about this trait a lot over the past few years where ransomware people are typically if you go back to if you've heard any of my other cyber presentations where there's a thing called 
dwell time, where dwell time is the amount of time that a hacker has access to your system before you know it. So they're in there for a lot longer than, than you think they are in most cases. Now that dwell time, I haven't seen the 2024 stat, but last year, I mean, we're talking like seven to nine months that people sometimes have access to your system before you find out about it. So with that access, they're around and they, they poke around and they figure out, am I, am I working with a small business here? Am I working with a big business? And what, what's their uh, fiscal health? So they, they kind of like toggle it to what they think they can get reasonably from you in, in that range of 0.13 to 8.3% of revenue. So you, you, you do the math on your own business. If somebody wants to get 8% of your revenue, you know, what's that going to equate to and how important is it for you to plan to uh, not be hit by a ransomware attack? Um, and, you know, that, that kind of helps bring things to uh, a reality point for you to, to work from. Um, other takeaways, <clears throat> human element, which is non-malicious errors, there's insider things which will be malicious, but so humans, whether it's clicking on a phishing email, which we're still doing quite often, and I think the stat in the report, I probably should have put it on here, but I think it takes less than 60 seconds for someone to click on a phishing link once they encounter it. So we're still clicking on phishing links. Um, so, but you've still got 68% of breaches are involving human error. Um, errors themselves, right around 28%, which is a little higher than last year. I think we were about 24%. And one of the things that you're seeing more, I've been talking about this for a while with third party risk um, being more and more prevalent because a lot of breaches are tracked back to the third party. So right now, the, this is the first year that I've seen this on the Verizon report, that they're um, actually saying that 15% of breaches are now documented to involve third parties, which is up pretty substantial from last year. Um, we had a, a question here talking about dwell time, asking how can somebody go undetected for seven months if you're using a managed service provider. So evidently your managed service provider, you have to make sure they're monitoring and actually monitoring the breaches. I'm just giving you the stat that from uh, industry sources, it's seven months is, is going out there. So just because you're using a managed service protective provider, I should say MSP, you need to be keeping tabs on them to make sure what they're looking at and that you're, they're actually doing good metrics. But um, just because you're using an MSP doesn't mean you're not going to have have a breach or that you're not going to be susceptible to common industry trends of a hacker having access to your system. You know, these hackers are very sophisticated in some, some cases. You could have a nation state, um, you know, where you could have Russia or China um, hacking into your systems as opposed to just some teenage kid in the, in the basement in the mother's basement playing Xbox. Moving on to some of the uh, industry highlights from this year's report. Is, and I just put on these six industries, try to do this a comparison from year to year. The, the biggest um, attack vector or pattern is the system intrusion, um, followed closely by uh, miscellaneous error. Privileged misuse is big in healthcare. Um, social engineering is basically everybody's been, get, everybody's getting hit by that with the exception of healthcare. So again, just to give you a little snapshot, and if you take the time to go get the, either the executive summary for the detail report, you can read the details on all these. It's, like I said, it's going to give you a summary per page of what's going on, and you can read more details. 
it's definitely worth a read to learn if there's what they're saying about your your particular industry. And then what the motivation is for why people are are attacking and this continues to be pretty consistent from year to year where one of the highest reasons why people are bad people do this is because they're making money doing it. So there, you can see on those four industries ranging from 95 to almost 100 percent they're doing it for financial gain. Espionage that has been dropping over the years and this, there wasn't anything showing up for the other categories, which has showed up in previous years as a, a grudge. So that could be a disgruntled employee. Um, people doing it for fun, which that, that has shown up in past years, but primarily in the 2024, it's been a, either espionage or financial gain. And like I said, espionage has been dropping over the past few years and it's down to in most industries, almost nothing. And with that, let's move on to our, our next um, CPU question. And Michelle, once it looks like we're where we need to be, just go ahead and advance the slide for me. Okay, thanks, Michelle. All right, so talked a lot about earlier about the risk assessment. And so um, again, basically all of us need to be performing risk assessments to understand what we're trying to protect. Because everything it's um I like to, to talk about it as far as uh scales, scale system like in Imagine the scales of justice. You have on one side of the scale, you have you know the risk, and then on the other side, the cost of controlling that risk. And you have to if you know make it equal out because you don't want to spend more money than you have to, because the you know if your if your risk is that you might lose say twenty-five thousand dollars. You don't want to spend a million dollars on controls to protect that risk because it's you know you're you're way 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 to the negative. So everybody has to understand what they're trying to protect, and you want to tie this back to your business strategy and make sure everything lines up with as far as your your risk. Um, so you have to do some homework and, and figure that out. And if you attended these risk um, webinars on a regular basis. We've talked about risk assessment in the past. Um, I know I most recently I did this in 2022. I'll probably refresh it and do a risk assessment um, webinar probably next year. But um, I break it into a five step process. You can definitely use the Verizon DDIR when you're conducting. Um, as a part of that five-step process, step two is specifically identifying risks, and then step three is analyzing those risks. So the Verizon report's going to help you to identify the risk as well as see how predominant it is for your particular industry. So again, it would help you with your risk calculation where you do just a simple math equation to do your um, impact versus likelihood. So you might have a risk that's very likely, but again, it's not going to cause you much impact. You can have the um, the opposite of that, where you have a very, very impactful risk, cost you millions of dollars, but very much a black swan type event that's not going to happen very often. So you just have to plan accordingly. Now, but you can do a search, find one of those risk assessment webinars from the past if you're interested or. In I guess I'm probably going to refresh that for next year's um, risk assessments that we do. And then we'll talk a little bit about risk mitigation because that's the whole thing again is you want to basically, you're never going to get to zero risk, but you want to be able to 
stay as low as possible on that risk um, equation and figure out what's what's left after you've mitigated the risk and is that an acceptable level to help your business achieve your goals. But again, the Verizon report and the detailed version goes deep into this. I'm gonna go through like the top three risk attack vectors patterns. We'll talk about the, the controls that you can put in place to mitigate those risks. But again, Verizon has closely aligned to the uh, the CIS controls, the CIS 18, and we'll talk more about that in the next slide, but they, again, align closely with them for uh, suggestions on how to remediate risk in terms of the patterns that are showing up. Um, CIS stands for Center for Internet Security. You can do a Google search on it, or it's uh, cissecurity.org, there's version 8.1 is just out there. CIS is one of those free resources for individual companies. If you're going to be, a, if you're doing a consulting business, you're not going to be able to get it for free. You're going to have to pay them for it. But if our individual companies out there are able to register and download the, the versions and use it, and it's uh, basically there's 153 safeguards. I'm going to talk through it. Um, over the next couple of slides, give you a little bit more detail, but it's, it's just one of the control frameworks out there. It's, you can use it. It's not meant to be a replacement. It, I mean, you can, it aligns closely with things like NIST or ISO. So if you're already using one of those frameworks, you can look at CIS. It's got the crosswalk to say CIS control X is equal to ISO's standard, whatever, 2701, and it equates to this other one. So it gives you the map to crosswalk it, but um, it's, it's one of the things out there, but it's, you, know, you can you, you can make the decision for yourself if it's something that makes sense for your, your business. Um, again, CIS breaks itself down into three groups of controls, and they're basically sophistication level, so you can look at the little um, icon where it breaks into three and it's just different versions of security where one is what you should do for foundational control all the way to three, which is a very sophisticated um, level of support, which keeping in mind that scales of justice type thing, you know, it depends on what you're protecting to how much you want to spend. So. Maybe it makes sense for your business to just be at group one level. Maybe you've got such sensitive data that you have to do all the way at group three, but that's, that's a decision that you have to make. Um, just on a quantity basis, group one has about 56 controls across the, the framework. Group two adds another 74, and then group three is 23, so it adds up to 153 controls total. But again, you have to look at what risk you're trying to mitigate. Um, you're going to have some residual risk no matter what. You'll never be at zero. So it just it depends on how you get to your what equation makes sense to you with whatever residual risk is left over after you apply your controls and does that align with your business strategy and what your upper management wants to do. So it's just, it's all, it's all math. Um, this is a little bit of an eye chart, but I just wanted to show you what, this is a image depicts the, um, the three, you can see the 18 controls first off, and then it's got the three, three groups, the um, I1 through I3 that we just talked about. And you can just get a, if you actually download the, the framework, you know, again, you just provide your email address and you're going to be able to download it. Um, but it is free if it's for your individual use, um, not free if you're going to be a consultant trying to use it. But, um, that's the names of the different controls. And I'm going to talk about the, the Verizon um, industries in a, in a couple of slides here, but just talking about those the different groups. 
that we're going through. Um, that it's the, the layer of, you know, from foundational to very sophisticated. And this next slide tells you just from a CIS perspective, moving to the different, um, implementing the controls in the different group section, um, what, what is out there. Sorry, this, if you, if you hear that phone ring, this is my daily spam where they call my cell phone and I don't answer for the name immediately call my office line, which irritates the heck out of me. I might do a, for you members in the audience that are older, I might do a Seinfeld and uh, answer the phone call one time and just try to drag them out, keep them on the phone for like an hour or so, see if I can uh, ruin their day. So they're talking about the different um, groups, group one through group three. Here's just an example of like, say for example, if you were on IG1, you'd be 70, you put in all the controls there, which there are 56, I believe. You'd be 77% safe. Or if you went all the way to group three, you'd be like 94% safe. And that's for the various attack methods there. I thought that was an interesting slide. But again, the take, one of the takeaways is you're never going to be 100% um, protected from risk. So even at the most sophisticated level, you're you're running at you know 90 to 98 percent. There's always a little bit of residual risk left up. So specifically talking about the CIS controls on this year's report. So I grouped the, the top three, which were system intrusion, ransomware, social engineering, and then errors. So and then I'll talk a little bit about the CIS controls. So for the first group, there's basically two, two sets of CIS controls that they're, you know, it's a bigger list. So you've got four, five, six, seven being from secure configuration to vulnerability management. And then also moving on to hitting email, malware, security awareness and training, I think is a, is a, item in all three of those top three risks. Then moving on to social engineering, you know, you're gonna again only hit our four groups they're gonna suggest, which would be five, six, again, 14, security awareness, and then they add in 17 incident response. And then the last one, human errors, again, just four controls, data protection, vulnerability, awareness, skills and training and then uh, application security. So it just varies with those controls and you can, I showed a couple slides back where you had all 18 and you can actually download that framework, framework at, um, at the CRS website and just Google it. Again, it's free if you're an individual. Um, so that's moving on for our last CPU question. Now, this is the easiest one of the CPU questions, just a yes, no. So just a couple seconds in the show. Let me know when we, looks like we've got everybody so we can uh, move us on to wrap up. All right, thanks, Michelle. All right, so now let's uh, go ahead and um, to do our wrap up, and we'll we'll go through, and we'll got a few minutes left here. We can uh, see if we got any questions, and we'll address those questions as we as we um, as we encounter them. And if um, by any chance we don't get to your question, we'll we'll respond to you after the fact by an email or a phone call. Um, but so Michelle. Do we have any questions out there? I mean, I saw the one from uh, Karina about the dwell time in the MSP that I already addressed. So are there any other ones that have come in with in your monitor? Yes, we have a couple questions that were submitted. The first one was, 
Can you tell us more about the CIS Top 18? Um, actually, what, what, uh, in addition to what uh, I already talked about earlier with the, um, you know, the 18 controls and the three groups, um, but it's it's a good it's a number one it's a free resource, and it's it's built on a community type approach. So it's got people from industry, from government, from institutions, education. So it's a pretty good consortium of opinions that are assembled and put together. Um, definitely, it controls. It put, provides, I should say, a crosswalk to other controls or control frameworks. So it's just a good overall source of information and they, they update it annually. I think that um, you can get past versions, but they are up to, I believe, version 8.1 now. So good resource to use. And um, again, it's free. So if you have any, go out and do a search of it and, and get it. Um, and it's um, you know, the, the website is provided in the, so you know you're downloading information from a, a valid source, but um, I would highly recommend it. And again, the DBIR links specifically to the CIS. So when you read the report or download the, the Verizon report, it's gonna tell you the exact control, which you go to that control. And then if you're using a different framework, it's gonna have the crosswalk, which is gonna take you to that. So it's, it's just an all, overall good piece of uh, information for you to be able to use. Any other questions, Michelle? Yes, we had one uh, last question. Someone put, what takeaway from this year's report did you find the most interesting? Um, probably, well, I, I find the entire report interesting and I look forward to it every year. But I, I thought it was interesting how they did the combination of ransomware and the extortion. Um, and then furthermore, they went to the detail to elaborate on the actual quote unquote formula that the bad guys use for calculating a, a ransom that they thought was reasonable for your company, that they had a good shot of um, getting it paid, which I think it was from like 0.13% to 8.3% of revenue. So that was a pretty interesting takeaway for me. And then it, I was actually happy to see that they highlighted third-party risk because I've been uh, talking about SOC 2 reports and various things where you've got your security providers out there as far as uh, posture with your you've heard of BitSight or Security Scorecard, where they actually go out and rate third parties for you. Um, and I've been saying that's coming and it's gonna be a bigger and bigger thing because all the way back to the Target breach where, if you remember the Target credit card breach, which was the cause of a third party, you know, saying the warning that third party's a big risk, third party's a big risk. And finally, I get to read in the data breach investigations report how third party breaches have jumped up exponentially and it's now you know a topic of a key takeaway in the Verizon report so that was that was um, very interesting to me but um, again free resource on the CIS free resource on the Verizon DBIR so if you're not one of the people that read it and you don't have to read the 100 page report but just download the um, executive summary it's a quick read about 17 pages gets the high points and then you've got the option of downloading a industry specific report you know to line better up for your your particular company so a lot of good free resources and if you run into issues or questions um, you can go ahead and you know reach out to me my contact information's up on the slide right now it's um in the slide deck as well, you can call me or email me, and I'd be happy to uh, happy to give you some input or help you out. So again, um, thanks for attending. I'm assuming we're out of questions, Michelle. Yes. Okay. All right. All right. So again, thank you for attending today's webinar. I hope you found it valuable and and worthwhile. 
Um, I enjoy putting it together and um, hope you found it uh, informative. And then I wanted to give you a placeholder for our August webinar, which is going to be on the 28th of the month, again, from 10 to 11. We're going to have a guest presenter. We're going to, um, our, uh, the internal uh, MSP for HBK that uh, does MSP services for a lot of uh, external clients. Uh, Vertilocity is going to be our guest speaker. So um, we'll send out the invite in, uh, in a couple weeks here, but um, placeholder, it's going to be the 28th at uh, 10 a.m. So again, thanks for attending today's webinar and have a great day and um, you know, stay cool.